Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, uh, grab your Bibles or your apps, whatever you read on, and turn to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Now, uh, as you're turning there, let me uh, pose a question to you. Have you ever uh, heard a child pray, like a, like a little kid? Um, I have a five-year-old son named Knox at home, um, and I love that kid, uh, but I love to hear him pray. I, I love the, uh, how do I say this? I love how he has not been corrupted by all the traditions and things that the Bible doesn't say. That, you know, growing up in church or whatever has corrupted his, the way he approaches prayer. Uh, and what I mean by that is that kid, when he goes to prayer, when, when he sits down and prays at night uh, before bed or at a meal, that kid prays whatever he's thinking. Whatever is on his heart in that moment, he prays it. And I love that about uh, small children. I love that when he prays, um, he lifts up whatever he's thinking about, whoever he's thinking about. If the dog's been sick, he's going to pray for that dog. Uh, if he's got a friend who hurt his feelings at school, he's going to give that to God, and he's going to talk about that with God. Um, if mom or dad has a concern or something that they're dealing with, he's going to lift that up to God. Uh, and he doesn't go to God and say a bunch of these and thous and all that stuff. He just goes to God and just lets it out. Isn't that cool? I love listening to him pray. It's just one of those things that I love. Um, and let me be honest with you in this moment. Prayer is hard for me. Of all the spiritual disciplines or whatever you want to call it, Bible reading and thinking about God's word and going to church and praying and all those different things, prayer is the one that is the most difficult for me. Um, you know, I I can read my Bible and I can study God's word and I can read Christian books and that comes very easily to me. I do that on a regular basis. Obviously, uh, coming to church is very easy for me. I get paid to do so. Um, so that's not a difficulty for me. But I have to be intentional about praying. It doesn't come so naturally to me. And don't raise your hands to this, but how many of you struggle with prayer? How many of you in this room would say, you know, I did have a time or I'm currently going through a time where prayer isn't as easy as some of the other things uh, in my Christian life? Or maybe you're a newer Christian. Maybe this whole following Jesus thing is uh, kind of new to you and prayer is one of those high and lofty kind of up there in the clouds kind of things that can be hard to grasp, it can be hard to understand. Well, Luckily for us, Jesus talked a lot about prayer. Prayer was a big deal in Jesus' life. And we're actually going to look at a passage uh, this morning in Luke 11 uh, that Jesus addresses prayer. And so look at Luke 11. We're going to start in verse 1. Luke 11, verse 1, <clears throat> says this. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say this, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Let us eat, give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, Lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is a friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For whoever asks, receives. And whoever seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more 
Will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Wow, what a great teaching lesson from Jesus. What a great time when Jesus really gives some great instruction and very applicable instruction on prayer. Uh, And if you're struggling with prayer, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about a few things that Jesus teaches in this passage in Luke chapter 11. So here's the first thing that we need to understand. The first question is, what's in a prayer? What's in a prayer? Uh, What kind of things, when we go to God, should we include in our prayers? And according to the Lord's Prayer, which is kind of our blueprint, it's the blueprint that Jesus gave us for the structure of a prayer. In that blueprint, no matter which of the versions you go to, you go to Matthew. Matthew's version is the same prayer, only expanded on a little bit. But no matter which of the Lord's prayer, the versions you look at, there are four elements in that prayer. And those four elements are praise, provision, forgiveness, and guidance. So let me talk about those four elements for just a moment. Praise. That's the first element. That's the part in the Lord's Prayer here where he says, Father, hallowed be your name. Okay? So the first one is praise. And praise is basically us telling God how amazing he is. It's telling God who he is, who he is in our life, and how amazing we think he is. So in your prayer life, maybe you go to God and maybe the first words out of your mouth are Almighty God or loving Father Uh, Or amazing God, or you know, some name that you attribute to God that is personally very important to you means a lot. And so that's what praise is. Praise is that chance, that opportunity in your prayer life to say, God, you are amazing. You are awesome. Here's who you are, and here's what you've done. You are so spectacular in my life. So praise. The second one is provision. And this is very simple. This is simply asking God to provide some of the things that you need in your life, or maybe you're asking for God to provide something in a friend or a family member's life. It's asking God for something. It's going to God and saying, I need this. Maybe it's a physical need, maybe it's mental or emotional, or maybe it's a spiritual need that you have. God, help me grow in you more. Help me be more patient. And we all know what happens when we ask that question from God. But Maybe it's some aspect of your spiritual life or your physical life or your mental or emotional life that you need God to help provide something extra. The third part is forgiveness. And this is simple. This is just asking Jesus to forgive us, asking God to forgive us for the wrongs that we've done, the sins that we've committed. And and so it's going to God and saying, God, here's what I did. I messed up. I sinned. Will you forgive me? Because that's what the blood of Jesus did for us on the cross, is forgave us, cleansed us of our sins. And the fourth and final uh, element to prayer is guidance. And guidance is simply asking Jesus, asking God to help you, to guide you, to give you direction. And let me chase one rabbit this morning uh, on this point. When you go to God... And you ask for guidance or direction or for a word from him about something in your life that's going on. If it's truly from God, it will always line up with his word. In other words, if you go to God and say, God, provide some direction here. Help me make this decision. Whatever he gives you, whatever word you hear, whatever direction you feel God is giving you, it will always perfectly line up with God's word. What you hear from God will never contradict God's word, God's Bible. So if you hear something from God and it doesn't line up correctly with your Bible, with what God says and instructs us in his word, then what you're hearing is not from God. It's from another source. It's either your own selfish desires coming up and uh, being thought in your own mind, or it's the devil trying to deceive you. You hear me on that? You're you're clear? When we ask for guidance, God's going to give it, but it will always perfectly line up with his word. So if you go to God and your finances are a little tight and you go to uh, do your taxes and you say, God, you know, if I just tweaked this one little thing in my tax return... 
It would really help me out a lot financially and, and really get me ahead here. And you hear God say, yeah, absolutely, do that. That's a good idea. That's not God. That is your mind going, ooh, money. <laughs> because God will always tell you to follow the law. God will always tell you to be a godly and righteous person. And so whatever you're hearing from him, it will line up with his word. Which on a side note, that's why we need to know God's word. So that we know whether or not we're hearing from God or whether we're only hearing from our selfish desires or the devil speaking into our ears. So, those are the four elements to prayer. Praise, provision, forgiveness, and guidance. Now, I'm not saying that every single prayer that you pray throughout the day has to have these four elements. Because 1 Thessalonians tells us that we should pray continuously. That we should never cease praying. But if a high schooler is walking into his class to take a really important test, then I've never told that high schooler, you've got to have all four of these elements here. If you, before you walk in that classroom, you better praise, and you better ask for that help in that test, but you better ask for forgiveness and guidance also. That, that's not what God's saying here. God's saying that you need to have all four of these elements in your prayer life, in your prayer habits. And so if you go through an entire day and you've prayed one time or two times or five or 10 or 20 times throughout a 24-hour period, and you've never once praised God, then there's a disconnect in your prayer life, in your prayer habits. If you go through your entire day, and you've prayed several times, and you've never once gone to the Lord and said, I recognize my sin and I ask that you forgive me of that sin, then something's wrong with your prayer habits. Something's not right with your prayer life. In other words, in a day, in a time span, you should hit all four of these elements. Not every single prayer, just in your prayer habits, in your prayer life. So, that's what prayer is. That's the structure. Those are the elements that prayer involves. But that leads us kind of into a different question about prayer that we need to answer. And that question is this. Why do we pray? We've answered what's in a prayer, but why should we do it? Because if there's no benefit, if there's no reason, if there's no reward, if there's no motivation, then what's the point? Why should we bother with it? So prayer has to have a motivation. There has to be a reason that we do it. And let me, before I tell you the reason you should do it, let me tell you the reasons you shouldn't. In other words, what your motivations should not be. And here's the first one. Your motivation to pray should not be that you have to do it out of obligation. Oh, I got to pray today. Crud, I got five minutes before I go to bed. I better pray. You know, that, that shouldn't be our motivation. It shouldn't be because it's my duty as a good godly man or woman to go to God in prayer on a regular basis. That's not why we should be praying. Yes, it is something that we should be doing as a follower of Jesus, but it shouldn't be an obligation to us. We shouldn't feel like we do it out of our duty as a follower of Christ. So that's the first reason, the first bad motivator. The second bad motivator, the second bad motivation to pray is to get something from God. In other words, if all you ever pray about is your needs and what you want from God, then your prayer life is kind of ill. It's unhealthy. It's sick. Because God is not a magic genie up in heaven just wanting to pour things, uh, every little need that you have that you give to him out to you. That's not how God works. Uh, God's going to give us what's best for us in his godly infinite wisdom and knowledge. But if all you ever do is ask for provision, if all you ever do is ask for things from God, then something's not quite right. That shouldn't be your motivation. Because here's what prayer is. Here's what should be our motivation. Prayer is a relationship. And if you don't hear anything that I have said up to this point, and you don't hear anything that I say after this point, I don't care as long as you hear this sentence. Prayer is a relationship. That's what prayer is. It's not an obligation. It's not a Q&A session. It's a relationship with God. 
Knox and I, my, my son, my five-year-old son, Knox and I are good buddies. If you were to ask me or his mother, uh, Jana would tell you, Knox is a daddy's boy. Uh, I just have a special connection with my son that is not quite as close with uh, my son and my wife. And Knox and I, I take him to school most days, I pick him up most days, we hang out, we talk, we play games, we do all sorts of stuff together. I mean, my 2004 Dodge Durango is the fastest rocket ship in Lake Havasu City, (laughs) with the most accurate laser pistols on it. I mean, we play constantly, and and we have that special relationship there. But if I decided one day that I no longer needed to talk to Knox, and I just stopped talking to him altogether, what would happen to my relationship with him? It would, it would fizzle, it would fade, it would, it would be unhealthy, it would die away. And vice versa, if Knox decided one day, you know what, I don't need daddy, I kind of got things handled, what would happen to my relationship with him? It would fade, it would fizzle, it would die. You see, prayer is a relationship with us and God. And without that communication line, without us talking to him, that relationship, that life-changing relationship will fizzle and fade and become unhealthy. Because we need it. It's important. It's the first step to having a healthy relationship with God. And so think back to the four elements that I talked about in prayer. Praise, provision, forgiveness, guidance. Okay, think about those four elements for a moment. Praise helps us to realize, to live out, to understand how much we love God. Think about that for a second. If Knox thinks about how much he loves me, and he tells me how much he loves me, and he thinks about and dwells on and and lives out his love for me, his love's going to grow. His love for me is going to be nourished, and it's going to be healthy, and it's going to continue to grow. And same thing with us. The more that we go to God and we tell him we love him and we tell him how amazing he is and we recognize what he's done in our lives and we praise him, that's going to nurture our love for him. When we go to him and we ask him for provision, when we ask him to provide something for us, it helps us to understand our dependence on him. Now, let me give you an example again from my son Knox. We have a great life at home. I'm a blessed, blessed man. Um, But one of the difficulties that I have with my son is my son has night terrors. Um, It's genetic. I had them when I was a kid. My dad had them when he was a kid. My grandmother and grandfather had them when they were kids. It's just something that we have and we have to deal with. And my son, a few times a month, will wake up in the middle of the night screaming bloody terror because he's caught in a nightmare, but he's awake living it out. And he doesn't have the ability to wake himself up when he's in that night terror. And so he physically lives that out until someone intervenes and wakes him up and gets him out of it. And it's a scary situation. It's a bad situation. It's not good for Knox. It's hard to watch as a parent. But when he's going through that night terror... And he's sitting in his bed screaming. And he can't do what he needs to do to get out of that. And he needs someone to intervene. When I walk in that room and I pick him up and I embrace him and I help him wake up, it builds his dependence on me. It shows him how much he needs me. Because I'm providing something for him that he cannot provide on his own. He becomes dependent on me, which I want. I want my son to need me. I want my son to love me and reach out when he needs something. Just yesterday, um, he, had a, he wanted an apple. And he looks at me and goes, Daddy, can I have an apple? I was like, yeah, sure. And I go to grab the apple to hand it to him. He goes, Daddy, can you cut it up? I don't need to cut it up for him, but he can't do it on his own. But he's more than capable of eating an apple that's not cut up. He does it all the time. But in that moment, I made the choice out of my love for my son 
to provide something that would bless him in that moment and convey my love to him. And so I sat down, I cut up an apple and gave it to him. Small thing, but it was something he couldn't do for himself that I could communicate my love to him. That's what you do when you go to the Lord and ask for his provisions. So praise, provision, all part of the relationship. When we ask him for forgiveness, we begin to understand better how much he loves us. In praise, we understand how much we love him. But when we ask him to forgive us and he shows us mercy and grace, it teaches us how much he loves us. So when my son comes to me and he's done something wrong and he says, Daddy, I did this, I'm really sorry. And I show him grace in that moment. Guys, if my son does something wrong, there's going to be consequences. But if he comes to me and he's honest, uh, one of the policies in my house is if he confesses what he's done and he goes and he comes and tries to rectify it and, and ask for forgiveness and, and says he's sorry and tries to correct the wrong that he did, the punishment is lessened because I want my son to be someone who is open and okay with confessing his sin and open and okay to admitting when he was wrong and correcting his mistakes. When we go to the Father and we ask for forgiveness, just like when I'm merciful to my son, it shows my son how much I love him because I don't have to show him mercy or grace. I could still punish him at the level that I wanted to, but I convey my love to him when I forgive him. And then lastly, when we ask for guidance, we submit to him more. You know, when we communicate that we need some direction in our lives, it shows us how much we need to submit to God's guidance and direction. You know, when my son comes to me and has uh, a difficult problem that he's trying to work through or he's had something that's happened in his life and he's looking for comfort or advice or direction or maybe some schoolwork that he can't figure out, when he comes to me and I can answer those questions, it helps him understand that I've got authority, that I have knowledge and wisdom that he could use and, could, and maybe needs. And when we go to God and ask for guidance, that's what we get. We understand that God has wisdom and knowledge that we may not have, but maybe we need. So all these elements of prayer build our relationship. Because relation, build, prayer is relationship. But brace yourselves. Because I'm about to say something that may hurt your feelings. So are you ready? Okay. God does not need your prayers. Let me be very blunt. God does not need your prayers. If you never prayed to him, God would be just fine. Because God is all perfect, all sustainable, never changing. God is perfect in every single way. He does not need you. In other words, you, this is not God. You are not the center of God's universe. In other words, it works the other way. It should be God and God is the center of your universe. Because guess what, guys? We need him, but he does not need us. He doesn't need our prayers. But just because he doesn't need them doesn't mean he's a jerk. It doesn't mean that he's some judgmental God with a lightning bolt in his hand ready to cast it down on us. It just means that he's perfect and we're not. God does not need anything. As a matter of fact... God doesn't even need to know what you're asking because the Bible says, if you go to Job and Psalms and, and many other passages, the Bible's pretty clear that God knows everything you need better than you know what you need. He knows your past, he knows your present, and he knows your future. So he knows exactly what you need in your life. And not only that, no, God knows every single thought that runs through your head before you even have it. And so the fact is, is that God doesn't need our prayers. He doesn't have to have them. So why do we do it? Why do we pray? Here's why. Because prayer is for us. Prayer is for us. God doesn't need it. We need it. We need to have it in order to have a healthy, life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. It all goes back to relationship. 
If we want to have a healthy relationship with God, we have to be communicating with him. We have to be praying. So God doesn't need the prayers, but we do. And let me be honest here. Think about this for a second. Would you rather have a God over you that doesn't, that you know, needs your prayers and he has to have you pray to him out of obligation because it's a necessity that he has? Or would you rather have a God that wants you to pray to him because he loves you and because he wants to have that connection with you? Not because he needs it, but because he wants it. Because let me make this really clear. Even though God doesn't need our prayers, prayer is his desire. Prayer is his desire. He wants us to pray. He loves it when we pray. You know, I don't need Knox to come to me and say he's sorry, but I love it when he does. I love it when Knox comes to me and says, Daddy, I'm sorry I did this. I don't need that, but I desire it. I love it when he does that stuff. I love it when Knox comes to me and says, Dad, I had a great day at school, and here's what happens. And he, he shares all that. I don't need that, but man, I love it when he brings that stuff to me. It just fills me up. It makes me feel so good. And I love it when Knox comes to me and says, Dad, this boy at school hurt my feelings. Because that gives me a beautiful opportunity to connect with my son and teach my son. God doesn't need our prayers. He desires them. He wants them. He loves it when we come to him in prayer. He absolutely wants you to do that. But he doesn't want the sugar-coated version of you. He doesn't want sugar-coated Pastor O.C., with a smile on his face all the time and nothing's ever bad, and no complaining, no sadness, no frustration. He doesn't want sugar-coated OC. He wants real OC. He wants 100% of me. He wants my happiness, my excitement, my thoughts, my dreams, my frustrations, my anger, my sadness, my devastation. He wants it all. And let's face it, God already knows what you're thinking, so why would you hold back? He already knows what you're thinking. He already knows that you're frustrated, so why would you try and sugarcoat that? It's like you're lying to him almost. It's like you're trying to hide something. God wants all of us. He wants you to unload all of your life in front of him and bring that to him. Just like I love it when my son brings everything to me, God wants you to bring everything to him. He wants you to not hold back. He doesn't want nice sugar-coated. He wants real life. Believe me, he can handle it. He's God. He's a little more mature than you and I are. He's not going to get offended. And he's going to help you. Because when you go to him with your frustrations, God's going to use that opportunity to teach you and grow you. When Knox comes to me and he's thinking something that's not quite right or not quite lining up with reality, that gives me that opportunity to get down at eye level with my son and look at him in the eyes and go, buddy, here's what this really means. Here's what you should probably do. Here's how you should live. Let me pour my wisdom and knowledge into you so that you can grow. And when you take your frustrations, your sadness, your good and your bad, God gets down at eye level with you and he goes, son, daughter, I love you and let me guide you and pour my wisdom and my knowledge into you so that you can grow and be more like me. Don't sugarcoat, don't hold back. God wants all of you. He sees all of you anyway, so why would you hold it back? But imagine... Imagine for just a moment if your prayer life got healthier, if your prayer habits improved. Imagine if your relationship with God improved to the point because of your prayer life that your love for God was stronger than it ever was before because you were praising him on a regular basis, not just on Sunday morning, but every day. Imagine that you could stay strong when difficult times came because you could pour out your frustrations or your anger or your sadness in that moment and God could say, listen, son, daughter, let me give you the comfort. Let me give you the strength that you need from my Holy Spirit. Imagine if you were physically 
if you were mentally and emotionally, if you were spiritually more stable because you went to God and asked for that and God poured his wisdom into you, James tells us that we don't get wisdom because we don't ask for wisdom. If we want to be wise, we need to ask God so that he can take that wisdom out of his own character and pour it into us through his Holy Spirit. Imagine if you had that knowledge and that wisdom. Imagine that you wouldn't be riddled with guilt because rather than living in unforgiveness, you went to God and you asked him to forgive you. Imagine if all of that guilt and all that frustration of unforgiveness was lifted out of you and you lived in freedom. Imagine for just a moment that you for the first time felt that you could make a real difference, that you had real purpose and direction in your life because you weren't living in your own selfish desires, but through prayer, you were living in God's purpose, in God's direction, under God's desires. Imagine how your life would be different if your prayer habits changed. Here's my challenge. We seek relationships with the people that we love, right? And prayer is a relationship with a God that we love. So here's my challenge to you. For the next seven days, from today to this time next week, I want you to commit to pray every single day. And that the four elements that I talked about earlier are in your prayer habits every single day. And so every single day for the next seven days, you're praising God, you're asking God to provide for you and your friends and your family, you're asking God to forgive you of the mistakes and the sins that you've made, and you're going to God and you're asking for guidance every single day this week. And tell me that it won't change your life. Because guys, I told you at the very beginning that prayer is the spiritual discipline that I struggle with most. But I can tell in my own life and my own thinking processes, my thoughts that I have, when I'm not praying, when I'm not living my life praying to the Lord, my thoughts change. Things change for the bad in my life because I'm not seeking him and I'm not asking for forgiveness and I'm not praising him. When I'm not doing those things, it goes in a bad direction. So my challenge every day for the next seven days. Create some healthy prayer habits. Join me.